So yeah, welcome to this event, um, people in person. Thanks for coming, those online joining us and those watching the recordings later. Um, this session is being recorded, so um, you can only see the backs of your heads if you're in this room. But, but we, uh, we're recording it and we're going to make it available. So I um, hope you're comfortable with that. Um, so this is um, part of our week in psychology. And we're in our fourth event now where we're going to talk today about a little bit more detail about developmental disorders, try and give you a flavour of what that course contains and um, how it might be to learn on that course, you know, and see yourself on that course. So we have Kirsty Dunn here, who's a lecturer specialising in developmental psychology and working in developmental disorders as well. Um, I do a little bit of work on developmental disorders um, around uh, literacy and dyslexia. Um, happy to talk to you about that later, but it's mainly Kirsty who will be telling you about the developmental disorders. I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction first of all. Then Kirsty will give you a little bit more detail in her experiences on the course. And then Kirsty and I will have a little bit of a chat um, and take any questions that you have online. Um, feel free to add your questions in the Q&A or in the chat or in the room. So if you come and do postgraduate course here, then these are some of the people that you will meet uh, involved in our master's program. You might have seen this already if you've been to any of, of our events previously. Um, but the really important people here are in the top left of this picture. This is Claire and Nadine, and they occupy our postgraduate um, psychology office. And that office is dedicated to students who are doing our postgraduate programs in the department. And they're available um, in the process of application. If you have any questions about the degree programs in advance, then you can contact them. You can also, once you're on the postgraduate degree, pop in there and talk to them about anything I mean, absolutely anything, and they'll support you um, around your studies and point you in the right direction. So I use them all the time. They're just an invaluable resource for supporting our postgraduate community. There are other people here that you'll also be involved in uh, uh, working with. And the other important person is in the bottom right there, and that's Gina Fisher. And she's here to answer any of your questions about applying for degrees in the department. OK, so our facilities, you'll know if you're a student here already in psychology about some of our facilities. But as a postgraduate student, you really get much more involved in using those and using them to their full potential. And we do provide all these resources to you as uh, a postgraduate in our department. So I think once you become a postgraduate, it's, you get much more involved in all the activities of the departments. It's a much more exciting time uh, to be part of that research community. So it's improving your training and also getting you really involved in the very latest work that's going on in our department. So in terms of the quality of assessment of our environment, then we rated 100% of our research is rated as internationally excellent or world leading. So we also have our own building just for research and training and our postgraduate students spend quite a lot of time in there. The ground floor there is for the developmental research and the top floor is more for adult studies. And we have all the latest kinds of equipment that you need to do um, the best kind of work in developmental disorders in that building. And in particular, the bottom picture there shows the lobby of the ground floor. I don't know if any, any of you have seen this, been in there yet. But we have a full time person there working to support and advise on doing work with um, develop, developmental populations. And it's a really nice place for parents to come in with their children. Everyone feels at ease. Kirsty spends lots of time there, I believe, right? <laughs> it is a nice place to be. So we really have world leading child testing labs, some of the best facilities in the world for doing developmental research and developmental disorders. In our department, psychology at Lancaster, we have uh, lots of research strengths which are really spread about um, the key areas of psychology. And in particular, relevant to this course is our expertise in um, infancy and early development and that's indicated in this diagram by these two green leaves where one of the key themes of our research in infancy and child development is around typical and atypical development which is a core part of our developmental disorders program 
And we also much more generally look at children's social and cognitive growth from fetus, which is Kirsty's work, right through to toddlerhood and even into adolescence. So we cover the whole range of that. But I think what's really nice of being a postgraduate in our department, from my perspective, is that you are exposed to all these different areas of psychology and people with real expertise in these different areas. So if you're interested in developmental disorders, then you do need to know about social and cultural influences of that, but you also need to know about the cognitive mechanisms involved in that too. And having that social psychologist expertise and the cognitive psychologist expertise with the developmental researchers is a nice way to really draw out um, the cognitive and neuroscientific underpinnings to those, as well as their uh, cultural and social um, influences and effects. One of the other important parts of being a postgraduate student is that you really then come in connection with lots of people around the world who are uh, doing work in those areas that you find interesting as well. So this chart here shows um, all the active connections we have between researchers in our department and researchers in other parts of the world. So we have lots of connections with people in North America, few in South America, um, a lot of connections in Central Southern Africa, virtually every country in Europe, um, countries in Southeast Asia and Australasia as well. So lots of connections. And it's a really important feature, I think, to have that international perspective and to link you up with international researchers and workers when you're a postgraduate student. And so you can just um, piggyback on these networks and think about developmental disorders in all these different contexts around the world and talk to researchers in those countries as part of your studies. That's a really important aspect of being a postgraduate student and getting that extra training, I think. So we have four master's degrees here at uh, Lancaster, and uh, today we're going to be talking much more about developmental disorders. So I'm going to pass over to Kirsty, who will talk a little bit more about what it's like to teach on that and how that is structured, and then we'll open up for, for questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so um, as Padraig introduced me, I'm Kirsty, and I teach on the developmental disorders course, but I also took the developmental disorders course back in 2009. So I have some experience of the course as it was then and now as a student and as a lecturer on the course. So um, I can answer a couple of questions from both sides and I can sort of second that Nadine and Claire being the most important people in your lives at that point as our um, postgraduate uh, postgraduate administration team because they re you really can go to them with anything. They were the same, it was the same team when I was a student back in 2009 and they, they get us all through the course so that's, um, they're definitely gold. Um, so in terms of the actual course itself, um, what we aim to do is look um, a lot more in depth than you might do at these sorts of topics. You might have done some of these topics in your undergraduate course and you will have done um, if, you, if you did the undergraduate course here at Lancaster. Um, but you really start to look in depth and with a critical eye at some of the research that's been done in the field both here and across the world um, and look at how people um, really look to theory in developmental psychology when designing what to do next and what to investigate next. Really trying to work at not just what we can do and when we can do it, but how do we do it? And if, if we've got certain populations, say atypical populations that are doing things in a different way or appear to be doing things in a different way, is it because they're using different processes? Is it because the how is different? Or is just the what different? Um, and so it's really getting to the bottom of these sorts of things because that's how you can work out how you can help these certain populations um, in, in order to navigate the world around them in easier ways. So what you'll look at across the course is to look at um, cognitive effects of certain different disorders. What do we know already? What's well established in terms of what the effects are when we get these different neurological developments? Um, how best to support neurodiverse children as we know it at the moment, where we have those gaps in research in terms of how we think, you know, helping these children might be improved if do we learn more about something else. Um, of course, this is a field that's been researched for very many, many years, but it will be for many, many years to come. There are still lots for us to know. And these courses are part, uh, get, get you to grips with 
you starting to think for yourselves as well about what what should be happening in the future, what could be happening in the future um, as we're developing new techniques, new methods um, that help us answer new questions um, for these children. So you'll develop skills in conducting the research and analysing the data yourself as well. And part of this will help you to then look back on research with a more critical eye, having run through these sorts of things yourself. Um, it's very difficult sometimes just reading papers in your undergraduate studies um, and thinking, well, could they have done this? Could they have done that? It's very difficult to critically review a paper when you haven't run that procedure yourself or worked with that population yourself. And this, would, this course will give you a chance to do that. Um, and all of a sudden, things click into a place a, a lot easier because you can visualise what these, what these researchers were doing when they were doing this study. Um, what seems like a reasonable improvement to the study and what actually is quite unpractical when you're working with certain populations. Um, so you will learn from leading international researchers. So um, as uh, Padraig has, has talked about, the university itself is very well connected across the globe, but so are the researchers within the department and so in, in your lecturers that teach on the course. Um, they're working internationally with lots of different people. And by proxy, you will be too when you're taking part in these studies. Um, and they will be keeping up with the leading research around the, around the world to help you be able to do that too. Um, lots of different parts of the world have different technologies which enable them to answer different questions. And we can all work very complementarily to bring all of this together to create a good picture of what's happening. Um, so you'll be using um, our uh, facilities for teaching and research, which is some of the facilities that um, Padrex has talked about with our baby lab. We have lots of different measures in that lab. We have neural measures um, using EEG to look at um, infant neural development. We have um, an ultrasound lab where we measure um, fetal heart rate and uh, behavioural measures, looking at their movements in response to different sounds and different shapes. Um, we have eye tracking facilities where we can have very clever designs to have a look at where infants and toddlers are looking when you're maybe teaching them something, maybe language, um, whatever it is that you are particularly interested in for your topic of choice. Um, can you think of other things that I am missing? VR labs. We have um, some labs with some of the um, dissertation um, lecturers that we have on this have virtual reality labs um, where we can have a look at how we um, see ourselves interacting in space under certain conditions and things like that. So more than the technology, we have um, experts working with the technology that enable you to work with it in creative ways because the technology isn't the, isn't the end game. The end game is how you use it and what questions you want to answer with it. And um, we have a really good team here that's um, very good in sort of coaching to get to bring your ideas to that technology. Um, can you think of anything else we might want to say about that sort of thing? Shall I move on to the structure? Yeah. We can go. All right. Then. So going through the content of the course, you will have two sort of content modules, two skills modules, uh, an option module for you to choose from a number of options and then what will run alongside that throughout the whole year is your research dissertation where you'll work closely with a supervisor. Um, so just going through those, we have the developmental disorders course. So this will teach you content about developmental disorders. It's, bought, it's taught by both researchers and practitioners within the field and they'll focus on particularly theories and practicalities of working with um, populations with autism. Um, so some of the um, methods that you might use with a typical population doesn't necessarily work very well with people with autism. They don't, they don't like experiencing things in the same way. So you have to be quite adaptive and creative. And these are the experts in how to do that. Um, they'll teach you theories behind what they're doing. So again, looking at why we, why we want to investigate this rather than just how and when we're investigating this. Um, and how, how it will help us learn and how, how it will help us improve the quality of lives for various different populations. Um, you'll look at other types of disorders where um, some of the symptoms or the, the behaviours that you'll see may overlap. So, for example, different communication systems um, disorders, developmental language disorders and reading disorders and um, 
people with Down syndrome. So some of these have very overlapping symptoms, but they experience the world in very different ways. So they need to be worked with in different ways um, and they need to be understood in different ways. And so what we have is the experts that will teach you that particular content along that course. The developmental psychology module is a content module, but it's more moving into um, the sort of those theories underlying development generally of how we develop. So how to work with children as a whole, uh, what it's like working with children, theories of developmental psychology that come up from before birth and throughout development as a whole, not necessarily just children. Um, that will interact with other theories, of course, because children as they develop, will be developing different skills, social skills, perceptual skills, cognitive skills. So all of those will touch on those particular areas. So what's nice about this module is with developmental psychology, you are generally looking at how fetuses, infants and children develop, but crossing the different topics of psychology, which is something I really like about this module. You'll look at different methods. Um, for example, I teach uh, a neuro um, methods lecture where we look at the, the using EEG and FNIRs to measure different um, the ways the ways in which the brain responds to different situations. We'll look at the practicalities of it and bring it a bit more into life because sometimes when you're reading those papers, let's face it, they can be a little dull. But what they do is they bring it to life a bit and they get you to see, you know, the limitations of using it. Um, but of course, also the fun in trying to use those in different ways. Um, so, and I don't use that term loosely, it's actually genuinely quite fun. <laughs> um, and then you'll have two skills modules. So these will teach you things that will help you, skills generalizable uh, across that, those two content modules in terms of your assessment, but also going forwards after the course, particular skills that we need you to develop. So learning how to um, look at, visualize, analyze data in various different ways, various different types of data, they all need to be dealt with differently. Um, developing other transferable skills, like the management of that data, it can seem like something quite simple, but actually uh, requires certain skills to use. Um, data visualization, ethics, um, when you're conducting research, planning, time management, all of these things coming to this analyzing and interpreting, interpreting psychological data, which will help you in various different future careers in terms of taking information in front of you and knowing how to manage that information in terms of getting something useful out of it. There's also the conducting and presenting psychological research module. So this will develop this, those sorts of skills that are transferable outside of data management. So um, effective reading, effective literature researches, um, how to be efficient and selective in what you need to read about what. Um, where to go to for appropriate information that's that primary source, the stuff that we really need you to be looking at, where the work was originally done. Um, and then you can and then teaching you how to critically appraise that in a relevant way so that you can bring in all of these papers from different places that have found various different things that you are interested in and bring that together to create a big picture of well, what do you think? What do you think based on the relative the relative limitations, because no study is perfect, um, across the field, well, what do I now believe after reading all of this? Um, but then, and then following that, how to communicate that, presenting it orally, presenting it in your papers when you're writing your essays, um, presenting posters, um, critical skill, skills in, in debating, things like that. So there's lots of different creative ways throughout the course in terms of, of assessing these abilities that will then give you different ways of using your skills so that when you go on to use these in your future careers, you'll have experienced the skills in different ways. Because this would be useful, for example, if you were to con continue in, in a career in research, but also many other careers um, in terms of, you know, the ability to take information, know the limitations and the strengths of that invitation and then use it to create a judgment on something. You know, you can think of unlimited numbers of careers that that would be useful for. Then I said you'll have one option. So the options will be uh, analysing talk and text and that looks at sort of um, data that's a little bit more qualitative. So when I say qualitative, I mean in, as a, instead of the analysing interpreting data where you have 
clear numbers to work with. You might have interviews, you might have um, written work that you need to somehow pull out some sort of reliable information from. And that will teach you how to sort of have a critical eye over this sorts of thing and, and really pull out um, information in a sort of valid and experimental way. Um, so that can be really helpful for lots of things. Um, a literature review component, and then there is the psychological aspects of advertising. So that's new since I did the course, and that's sort of one of the ways in which we keep these courses quite up to date in that this has become a very popular area of psychology. Um, and so this is a new um, introduction to the course, well, since I did it anyway, and um, social psychology. So again, that is a very good um, component to this course because it complements very nicely some of the aspects that you'll learn about from a developmental point of view in the other um, modules. So you'll, you'll, be, you'll have your choice over those. And then running alongside that will be the dissertation research project. So what will happen at the start of the year is that um, a number of lecturers, so all of those people on that uh, first slide, will put up their sort of areas of expertise in which they can supervise a project that you can join in. You can discuss with your supervisor that, that you think you might want to work with a project. It could work on something they're already working on. It could be working on something complementary to that they're happy to help you develop um, and go from there. And in recent years, they have ranged from prenatal development, looking at how the fetus responds to different emotions, emotion and sounds that they hear in the womb, um, to looking at how um, children respond to sounds um, and respond to different visual stimuli between deaf and uh, hearing children, that sorts of thing. Um, so that's been a really interesting project. There's been projects looking at how, looking at CCTV footages and seeing how crowd behaves in various different emergency situations. So not all of the projects necessarily need to always be very, very developmental and they don't all need to be with children because you might have overlapping interests with other areas of psychology and they're also offered as well. Um, so there's a, there's a whole range of research projects there. Do you want to, do you, can you think of any other dissertation projects you'd sort of like to mention that's, that's out there or shall we move on to the next? Well, I mean, relating to specialism, um, so, mm. so there's all work on autism, so yeah. Yeah, so Callum Hartley, um, who will be back on the course next year, um, he specialises in autumn research and is a leading researcher in that area. And he's really pushing the boundaries in how we work with children with autism, trying new ways of working with them, working collaboratively with people, with other people. And so they, they're often very interesting. And he has very good relationships with uh, specialist schools um, around the area um, that, so that he has these links because these things can take time to set up. And he has these links to be able to, to work with them um, with students, um, which is really good. Yeah, OK. So in terms of the course, why Lancaster? So we're a small department um, of people. And you are well, well supported. I mean, I've sort of already alluded to, well, both of us have alluded to Claire and Nadine, the, the administration team, who, who will support you throughout a wealth of uh, various issues that you may or may not have throughout the course. You will work with internationally leading researchers in neurodiversity. Um, so all, all of the lecturers on the team are working internationally with various different research teams. So you will have that very kind of up to date knowledge base um, in terms of what's happening here, but also elsewhere. Um, and I really liked that balance. So when I arrived, I arrived from a different university that was quite big and I didn't, I wasn't known by and I didn't know a lot of people in the department. When I came here, I was immediately introduced to lots of different people and it just has that family vibe that I just really liked and, and hadn't experienced elsewhere. So I didn't realise that it was quite unique to a small university. Um, <clears throat> so in particular, we've got specialist groups, as we mentioned, working with autism spectrum disorder looking at languages and literacy impairments, such as dyslexia, developmental language disorders, various other reading disorders, um, which might well, uh, you might be interested in, in later development um, of, ch of children rather than infancy. Um, and th those sorts of projects really get to that sort of age range and that development there. Um, that being particularly important once hitting school age. 
Um, so you will have access to our bespoke facilities. We have latest technology, as I've mentioned in the other um, slides, um, it's for investigating children's cognitive and social development. So there is the sort of um, a sense out there sometimes of it, you need technology when working with infants because they can't tell you what they know. But that actually overestimates even adults. Adults don't always, they're not always able to tell you what they know. Um, and you think you know what you know, but it turns out you don't. Um, and if you use these other measures, it really get, it gets to the grips with what do we know and what we don't know and how do we things. We don't often know how we know we know or how we can do something, whereas this technology can help us do this. So the bespoke facilities and the latest technologies are good for, for working with infant development, of course, but they're also good for working with child development and even adult development. So you will gain a stepping stone into work with children and developmental disorders. Uh, that will prepare you for various different careers, but it will well prepare you for a career in clinical or educational psychology because you will be now used to, so for example, the Analyze Talk and Text module will help you. You might, in educational psychology, be doing a lot of interviews with children and that will get, help you get some experience with what to, what to do with that information to, to actually work out how you can help that child. It will help you in a stepping stone in terms of getting to that next stage for your um, educational development in clinical psychology, um, but it will also help you with a range of other generalizable psychology and non-psychology related skill uh, careers just through the nature of how many generalizable skills there are on the course. But you can see from the content modules they're very much, you'll have that knowledge base there ready for those clinical. Um, careers. So career prospects again. <laughs> so yeah, you will learn all of those transferable skills and they are assessed and they are, you are, they are experienced in different ways for a reason. You'll have a look at analytical um, thinking when you're reviewing papers, but also we have a hot topic debate in one of the modules where you, you actually have an oral debate on the spot with your, your peers. So you actually have to do this orally as well and it just gives you insight into using them in different ways because different careers will need them in different ways the ability to review information and come up with an opinion on what should happen next um, is is related to many many careers and life in general if i'm honest um, we have the psychological psycho, psychology employability program pep scheme so for those of you that have done your undergraduate here you'll you'll be familiar with this but for those who haven't um, that's a scheme that we have set up for relevant work experience. So um, you'll be on a, an actual um, program of work, which is in collaboration with either one of the researchers in the department or an external um, partner. So they may well be, for example, we've got ones at the moment that are advertised uh, with community support systems for children and adults and vulnerable adults in terms of helping them um, experience their sort of daily lives. So that's a community partnership that's set up. So that would give you experience in working with vulnerable populations. Um, we've had work experience with the MIND charity um, and that has given students sort of structured um, experience in terms of getting some of that clinical um, work there ready for applying for your next courses. Uh, we've also have relevant work experience within the department. So we have various different projects that will gain you different research skills different skills in um, experience in different projects. So that may or may not be related to your dissertation. It can be, doesn't have to be. You might think, well, my dissertation, I want to do it on this topic, topic with autism, but I'd also like to know a little bit about this other topic and a PEP scheme is advertised for a work experience. And it will just give you that snapshot in without taking up too much of your time. Uh, we have careers advice within the department, but also um, through the university itself. And that careers advice, unique to Lancaster, um, it's it's not, it's quite a rare offer, but this careers advice will be av available to you after any course that you do here. So all alumni of Lancaster University have access to the careers advice here. So it's not just careers advice, you can do practice um, in interviews, and I've made use of these before and very much benefited from them. You can have help and support with developing your cover letters and CVs um, because that's a skill in itself. Um, and that, that matters for getting you in the right place at the right time 
to be able to get your experiences. Um, and so that's something that you, you have a lot of support of here. You'll also have support from tutors within your department as well on this sort of thing. So that means then you do have genuinely outstanding and varied career prospects from a number of aspects. So summarising all of those things from access to different technologies so that you can learn those skills to generalizable skills and then help in helping you put that together in your CV to take your next steps. Because realistically, within one year, two years, depending on how you're taking the course with this, you're going to need to know where you're going next. So we can help you get on that ladder. Would you? Yeah, great. So I'm going to hand back to Padraig, who's going to go through studentships and bursaries. Thanks, Kirsty. So um, there are all sorts of different bursaries and scholarships to help a little bit with the fees for studying postgraduate at Lancaster. Um, some of these are available just to Lancaster University students, for example, the alumni loyalty scholarship, um, which is a guaranteed award based on your um, entry grades and can give you up to 20% off your fees if you're currently studying or have previously studied at Lancaster University. There's also the Lancaster Master's Scholarship, which is available to UK students, which can give you up to £5,000 off your fees as well. And that, again, depends on your entry grades, um, so your first class, uh, sorry, your first degree results. There are also other scholarships available to international students, the Lancaster Global Scholarship. And there's also the Lancaster Sanctuary Scholarship, which is available for people with refugee or humanitarian protection status or Ukraine citizenship, which can give you full fees, um, contribution towards living costs, and I believe uh, pay for your accommodation on campus as well. So details of all these schemes are available in that link. Um, if you apply, then you will be automatically considered for the scholarships and the bursaries and the one that is most beneficial to you will be applied to you. So you don't have to apply for that separately to just applying for your postgraduate degree at Lancaster. But our entry requirements for developmental disorders are, um, we look for a first or a 2-1 degree or the international equivalent in a psychology degree. But please do ask us about alternatives. So we do really welcome diversity in our student population and uh, we'd like to support students who we feel would be able to thrive um, even if they have slightly different background. We also look for an English language score of seven or above. Again, if you're not quite at that level, then there are ways in which we can support you to get to that level before the course begins. So again, please do get in touch about that. And really to emphasize that non-standard applications are welcomed. Okay, so do talk to us about it. Don't rule yourself out. Do talk to us about it if, um, if your route looks to be slightly different than this. And so how to apply? Well, basically via this portal, the link at the bottom, and it takes you step by step through the process. Very simple process really for applying. Um, if you're applying from outside Lancaster University, there's a £40 administrative fee you have to pay. But if you're a Lancaster University student, then it's much more streamlined, the approach. So there is no administrative fee because you're already registered in the university system. It's an easy application process. You don't need references or an academic transcript if you're a student here already, because we can pick that up automatically from your record. And you also have this guaranteed offer scheme. So Lancaster University students are guaranteed a place on a course if you meet the requirements. OK. So there's no need then to worry about whether you have a place or not. You will if you meet those requirements. And there's also this guaranteed scholarship, which is automatically awarded to help with your fees for Lancaster University students. OK, so anytime if you have questions about the admission process, you can email pgadmissions at lancaster.ac.uk. But you can also talk to us in the department as well. So before we go to questions and answers, um, the next steps if you want more information after uh, thinking about this, chat with a student at Lancaster University anytime via the Lancaster Connect. And there are master students here as well available to chat to you about it. You can also talk to a member of staff. So do come and see us one to one. Um, arrange a meeting with someone who teaches on the course to find out more about it. 
ask your questions there. Very happy to do that. Um, for that, then you can email g.fisher, Gina Fisher, g.fisher1 at lancaster.ac.uk and she'll set you up <clears throat> with the person most appropriate for you to talk to. Uh, you can also contact our department's postgraduate team as, as, um, as Kirsty and I have emphasised. Claire and Nadine in our postgraduate.psychology at lancaster.ac.uk office are always there to help. They are fantastic. And you can also have a, a look further details on our brochure postgraduate brochure there. Okay, so are there any questions that you'd like to ask in the room, first of all? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say it's fairly similar to third year, maybe a little bit more emphasis on the independent study. So I was talking to one of our uh, master's students earlier this week and she said there really is much more emphasis on that independent working and so you build up those skills even further based on than in your final year of your undergraduate for instance. Um, so for instance I'm teaching on the analysing and interpreting psychological data at the master's level and we have three and a half hours contacts each week for that module. Um, but there's also online resources that we provide as well so that you can come to those classes after some independent and group work so that you're really ready to maximize the use of that contact time. So that's the way it's organized on that course. But I'd say it's roughly similar to undergraduate third year at Lancaster, but with maybe a little bit less contact hours because you know we're opening up the world of research and and individual learning and supporting you in that more and more at that postgraduate level. Do you, do you want to add to that, Kirsty? Yeah, I think you also have your target or yeah. your courses that Yeah. Actually, do you want to come up yeah. and then pick you up on the microphone? So Kirsty just mentioned the the dissertation which runs alongside some of the modules. So our master students have started their projects about now. They're really beginning yes. the design of them, aren't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there's a support for that master's project for a much longer uh, period than you, you get at the undergraduate level uh, um, and running alongside those individual modules. I think that's the point yeah. you're making. Yeah. Um, Um, the difference, so if you were to take the developmental masters and ha with the disorders as the module, um, the difference in terms of your opportunities afterwards, um, your um, experiences afterwards, or your very minimal. Um, there is a lot of overlap of the two courses. Um, but for a good reason. Well, they're both they're both trying to develop as much generalizable skills as much as they are the content. But what you'll just have is much more focus on those clinical aspects. Um, but either one would help you to get to the next step of a clinical career because you do take the clinical aspects as part of some of the developmental as well. Okay. Can I add yeah. to that? Yeah. Um, so another difference between developmental disorders and developmental psychology masters is that in the developmental psychology masters, then there's more of an emphasis on the theory and the methods. So, for example, you do the advanced analysing and interpreting psychological data as well, which really brings you up to the, the very latest techniques in analysing and interpreting and visualising data, which is not the case in developmental disorders, which as Kirsty says, has a little bit more of that practical uh, direction to it. And I think also reflected in the kinds of projects that students do as well. So you're, again, there's a there's a huge degree of flexibility, as Kirsty mm -hmm. said earlier, in terms of the, the dissertation choices. But the direction we encourage you, if you're on the, you know, if the title of your degree will be developmental disorders, is to really consider the disorders as a strong component of your uh, thesis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
So any more questions from the room? OK, we've done our job. That's good. Are there any questions online? Can, OK, yeah, that's fine. So I've got some questions for you. Good. Yeah, so so I mean, it's really nice that you that you did the um, the developmental disorders masters yeah. and survived it and uh, and now thriving as yeah. a developmental <laughs> psychology lecturer. So what do you think the key skill was that you developed from the masters that built on your undergraduate? Um, this is going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, I'll try not to get too excited and run over there. Um, so the key skill, I think, I joined uh, the masters as a, a 2-1 student coming out of my undergraduate. And what I struggled most with is getting that really higher level analytical writing skill. Um, I just couldn't get those first when it came to writing essays and I didn't get what it was people were asking me. I just couldn't understand how, how my essay was any different. And what the uh, master's course really taught me, uh, particularly in that module where we talked about the skills, was where I was missing that extra bit that I needed in order to, to say what, why does it matter for how we can interpret any of this. Um, that sort of next step and it really helped me it, I just clicked halfway through the course and by the end of the course I went back to the start and I picked up one of my essays and I could easily identify for myself exactly why it was more the merit than the distinction at that stage so that essentially the two one or the first so it really helped develop that analytical analytical thinking in terms of not just what is good or bad a situation but what what's the bit that good that's good that matters for ability to do something with something or make a decision and what's the bit about the bad that matters um because not all good matters not all bad matters um and th that's the bit that i just couldn't get to grips with um and so yeah it really it really helped me with that it also helped me with networking as well i got to know a lot of researchers in the field and actually when i joined the masters i still had absolutely no idea what i wanted to do with my career and I think it was just through getting to know lots of different researchers in the field through the masters um I just realized I wanted to stay in it and and that was it so yeah a couple of things so I mean, the other difference in in postgraduate versus undergraduate courses is like the size of the classes so so what was your uh, reflections on that and you know how does that affect the interaction with students that you teach now on postgraduate level do you think mm. thank you um it, there was a huge difference because you do have those smaller class sizes so the conversations like you see you see each other a lot across these modules so the conversations quickly become a lot more natural than i think they do at undergraduate where you might have seminars with one group of people over here and then a different seminar group with this different group of people and then the next year you've completely changed again because there's just so many people um so very very quickly you get you get a lot more relaxed with saying your ideas even if you're not sure about whether they should be said or not and the what that does to a person is just really develop a your confidence in that it's fine to say things you're not sure about or that's the point of it and not lots, lots of different minds get involved then and you bounce off each other and you learn from each other a lot more so yeah for me it was a completely different experience because the conversations very very quickly became very natural across the whole group and you knew each other's strengths as well so that was a big thing knowing that um person over here is excellent with data analysis so you go to them for help <laughs> and then and you're really good at writing so they come to you for you know what do you what what do you think about this point um and lots of different things like that so you, you help each other by learning each other's strengths and just learning more about each other so yeah it was a completely different experience and probably went a lot of the way to improving my actual ability throughout the course as well so just having a lot more talk um so yeah yeah and that that resonates with my experience as a master's student as well so mm. those two points you make about you know having that extra year to really decide what's for you and where your own skills are that sort of discovery i think that was a really important mm. year for me but also just having people from all sorts of different backgrounds mm. and you know they've studied at different universities and then they come together at a, an, another university and hearing all those different perspectives and all that expertise really 
really interesting and valuable. It's a really nice community, I think. So what about um, teaching developmental disorders? So what aspect of that do you enjoy most on the course? Um, okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I most like teaching the neurodevelopmental disorders methods lecture, um, mostly because throughout my undergraduate, I just thought they were the driest lectures I'd ever been to. Um, and I really struggled to, to think I would, I would ever enjoy something like that. And then all of a sudden, um, once I actually got into my research career, I started using them and realized it didn't need to be that dull. Um, so I really like I really like teaching that for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's a, it's a longer lecture. It's not just an hour. We've got a couple of hours and we've got some practical time in there as well. So we can break it up and we can bring a bit more life to the actual measure. I like doing that. I like that for some people, they and, and, and I think it's the way that the literature is often written, is that neuro measures are the gold standard and that and that is it. But once you actually what you need for a neuro measure is that, you know, you need things to be completely still and very, very still. And then you try and use those with an infant and they're, you know, rocking around all over the place. And you think, oh, it's not that simple. It's actually quite difficult. And what, you know, what's what what are the effects of that? Um, and so what I like is really just getting us a, a deeper understanding of why it's really, really useful in particular scenarios, but why we why we don't need to rule out all of the other measures and why they why it needs to be complementary and not the be all and end all. And then following that, when we're looking at how people are using it in really adventurous ways at the minute, bearing in mind those limitations, that's what brings that fun element to it of like people are actually just having a great time working out what is how can we like push the boundaries of how we use this and really just sort of um and so that's quite exciting because we all sort of start to think about ways in which we could do this and how you know what fun that might cause in the actual lab itself so um i like teaching that because i think it brings a, a bit more life to people for for that measure where it is boring and then when you go back and you ultimately have to read those papers they don't seem as dull anymore um but also yeah just it gives that more depth of understanding of of putting an EEG cap on doesn't mean that is it, you've got the answer. Um, so it, it creates a bit more yeah, depth there. Stop me wriggling as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think our time's up, which um, for me is a pity because I was enjoying hearing more about your experiences <laughs> and your teaching. Um, but yeah, any questions you have then just please get in touch. We're happy to talk to you. And thanks very much for coming online, in person and later through the recordings. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.